It's a, it's a scripture, it's a passage about celebration, about joy, it's about thanksgiving, giving praise. Nehemiah chapter 8, I'm just going to start off with one verse, and then we're going to unpack this a little bit, jump around. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. This is Nehemiah saying to the people, the people of Israel, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, eat the prime rib and get yourself some Zinfandel. Or if you're a filet mignon type of person, get yourself some drier wine, Chianti or Bordeaux or something like that. Eat, drink, and be merry is essentially what he is saying. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. For some of you, you just got a new favorite verse, a life verse. Sermon title today is Celebrate the Steps. As we're in this sermon series called Rhythms, we've been talking about some spiritual disciplines. How do we rest? How do we slow down? How do we see God in each and every moment? He is our Sabbath rest. You know, before we do things for God, we need to spend time with God. Celebration is a rhythm that we need to embrace. We need to learn how to do it perhaps a little bit better. And so today's sermon title, Celebrate the Steps. Before you take a seat, turn to your neighbor, say, celebrate good times. Come on. Find three people. Celebrate good times. Come on. Awkward turkey. Ben, thank you for leading us. Celebrate good times. Come on. It's good to celebrate, it's good to have fun, it's good to find our strength in the joy of the Lord. I truly believe that when we even get a little bit of a taste of just how much God has done for us, specifically in the sending of his son Jesus to die for our sins, that we were once enemies with God, but now we are considered friends of God, children of God, that when we get a little bit of a taste of that reality, then there is celebration to be had. There is joy to be had. The joy of the Lord is our, our strength. So here we are focusing on this series of, of what we've entitled rhythms. How do we set ourselves up to find rhythms of a healthy soul? We talked about, like I said, rest. We talked a little bit about work. Last week we spent a little bit of time about how even our faith, you must kind of work your rhythm of faith when it comes to the spiritual journey that we're on. Uh, and so today, specifically on this four-year Sunday, our actual fourth year birthday was September 20th, two days ago, but because it's a Sunday, we're celebrating it here on the 22nd. We've, we've been doing this now for four years. Like, the, I, I don't even know what I really expected when we started and launched the church, but here we are four years later, and God continues to do some pretty cool things, which I'll get into a little bit here. Uh, but there is, there is an art to celebration, believe it or not. Like, there's an art to it. Like, I'm going to brag on, on Colleen, my wife, for a few minutes. Like, she is, like, the master celebrator. I, I've shared before that there are, are things that she does uh, for our kids, birthdays, special holidays, and she, which she just goes all out in celebrating them, making them feel special and unique. And, and she's just a master at it. She, she's amazing at it. You know, it, it's, it's whatever the, our kids are, are interested in that time. She goes all out in, in the smallest of details to kind of put some sort of a theme together. It could be like Minecraft for Shane or it could be all baseball for Dean. They wake up in the morning, they come downstairs, and the whole dining room is filled with stuff to celebrate their birthday. And, and she's so good at just like the smallest details. But do you know how difficult it is to celebrate the master celebrator? Like, I'm, I'm terrible at this. I, I, her birthday's coming up in a couple of weeks, so I need your help. Like, if you see me in the hallways, give me some ideas, some suggestions, because it's like, do you know, like, the, the pressure I'm under to celebrate her on her birthday coming up here in a few weeks? It's difficult. And, 
and I find, like, I, I know some of the things that she likes, but she doesn't dare allow me to buy clothes for her. I've been banned in that category. But there are some things that I know she does like, and, and so I, you know, I, 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 know, I do do that. But, but as far as, like, the, the little small details that, like, here she is. She goes crazy over our kids, and, and she's so good at, at celebrating other people, and, and now I, I need to celebrate her. Like, uh, there's pressure, people. I don't know what to do. I need your help. Because here's kind of where I feel this tension sometimes. Like, there's this art of celebration, and I think, I think with celebration, there's this tension of also, like, at least for me, correction. That it's easy for some people to celebrate. It's perhaps easier for other people to, to correct. So the big things, those are easy things to celebrate, right? So you have a birthday, you celebrate your birthday. You have some big family event, maybe reunion, you're celebrating the family reunion. Those are easy things to celebrate. They're big milestones today. Celebration Sunday, our fourth, our fourth anniversary as a church. It's, it's easy to kind of take this day and set it aside and celebrate the big things. It's a little bit more difficult to celebrate the small things. And, and one of the things that, that if Colleen's the master celebrator, I'm more the master corrector. So it's almost like, okay... What, what, is the, what is the deficit in a situation or what is the, the problem and how can we correct it to make it even better than, than what it is? Or what, what's the struggle and, and how can we fix it to make it even that much better? There's this tension that I fight between celebrating and correction. And, and I think maybe the reason why is because it, if I feel as though we celebrate too much, it, it can almost lead to like complacency. Like you're constantly celebrating and, and then nothing gets done. That if we're always correcting and never celebrating, we'll become critical, we'll, we'll burn out, we're, we'll wear down. If we're always celebrating and never correcting, we'll become complacent. So, you know, we end up dancing in the end zone while the other team gets on the field and is about to run the next play. There's, there's this tension that I feel even within my own life and, and even in the, the, the life of this church. And, and as I've kind of learn to sit and enjoy God, there is this rhythm of celebration that he puts into our daily lives. If I had to put a sermon in a sentence today, and I, it's going to be a, a, an easy, simple sermon, nothing too deep or complicated, but it's this, is that celebrating our steps allows us to recognize God's faithfulness in the past and then rely on his strength for the future. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. When we take time to celebrate, it allows us to look back over all that God has done, which then in turn gives us the strength to carry us forward to where God is leading us in the future. And we see that even here in the context of the story of Nehemiah. If you're familiar with this story, uh, what we have is you have Nehemiah who sees a problem, who sees a situation that needs to be corrected. If you're familiar with this context, the, the people of Israel have been driven out of Jerusalem, and, and the walls of Jerusalem have been down, they have been burned, they've been destroyed for over 150 years. Nehemiah gets word of this from his brother, and, and it mourns him so much so that he, he who is the cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes at the time, he, he goes to the king and asks for permission that he might go back to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And it was so surprising that, that when, you know, the walls being down for 150 years, that Nehemiah comes in, he casts a vision, he puts a team together, and they rebuild the walls in 52 days. 52 days. It takes six months just to get permits in this area to get something done. So walls that have been destroyed for 150 years, he comes in, he, he puts a team together with the, with the strength of the Lord, builds the wall in 52 days. This is such an amazing and surprising feat that it says even back in Nehemiah chapter 6, and when all the enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. Like <laughs> their confidence left because they saw what Nehemiah had just done. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. There's one of the things that I pray often is that, God, wh whatever you want to do in me and through me, I pray that in, in just my surrender as 
things happen, whatever that may be, that, that the only explanation is that God's hand was involved. Like, there's no way I can do stuff in my own strength. I, I can tie my shoes in the morning and get dressed, get out the door. And, but, but when things happen, when, when a church grows, when people get saved, when people in a few weeks are going to be baptized, like, there's some things that only are explainable because God's hand is involved. And this is what happened in Nehemiah's day. He, he comes in, he rebuilds the wall in 52 days, and even the enemies look and are saying, wow, their God must have done something. They're, the enemies aren't even giving credit to Nehemiah. They're, they're giving credit to, to God. And so after Nehemiah has corrected the situation, he leads the people into celebration. But it's a strange celebration. Not, not the type of celebration that perhaps you and I would think. Yesterday I had the honor of officiating a wedding. And there was lots of celebration that happened. There was lots of food. Lots of meats, fats, and sweet wines, and lots of dancing. It was a celebratory experience. But listen to how they get jiggy with it in Jerusalem. How they get down in J-Town. You ready? Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe. So Ezra was kind of like the priest or the pastor of that time. You have Nehemiah who's the project manager of the wall. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. This is the Pentateuch, the, the Torah, that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. On the first day of the seventh month, listen to, to verse 3. This is, this is how they party. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. Let me ask you a question. If I were to get up here and preach for six hours, how many of you would be excited about that? You better be cheering right now. Come on. This is, yeah, six hours, here we go. Man, if I go five minutes over, you guys are yelling at me. This, this is how they're partying. They're, they're reading the word of God. The, the pet, they're reading Leviticus. We're not even talking about like the Psalms or even some of the fun passages. They're, they're talking through like the law and how the community is supposed to interact with one another. This is how they, they party in Jerusalem. With the preaching of God's word. From early morning until midday. People often ask me, you know, what's next for us? What's, what's next for, for our church? How's the building search going? Is there a building search? Let me, let me just give you a little update on that. We don't have a building yet. <laughs> We're still looking. But if you know anything about this area, it is just, it's either one, extremely expensive, or two, there are these huge empty buildings, but they only have 20 parking spots to them, and so that limits us being able to enter into those places because townships or cities won't allow us in for the, the zoning that's needed for our type of a use. But we, we have a space like this that by God's grace and goodness, we've been able to gather here in a public school for the last three and a half years continuing to grow as a church, continuing to see people come to faith, continuing to see people get baptized, continuing to see people praise and honor and worship God, which often reminds me, like, the church isn't about a building. The church is about God's people coming together, sharing in his praise and his worship, and then going out into the community and being the church. So you've heard me say, hey, stop going to church and start being the church. Start just allowing God's goodness and grace to, to flow out of you as you interact with people and, and, and be ready with an answer for when they come to you with the question, why are you so happy? Why are you so joyful? How did you make it through that difficult time, that, that season? So people often ask me, okay, so what's next for Mission Community Church? And, and because I'm a, a master of correction, I'm always trying to find, okay, how do we fix it? How do we in, improve this ministry? How do we get more people involved in 
Bible studies or small groups or how do we get more people to commit in their development of faith. And, and so I'm, I'm a master corrector. I'm trying to figure out ways to make things better, to streamline processes, to put systems in, in place. And, and part of that is always constantly looking for a, a new place to meet, if that's a building, if that's a, a purchase or a rental. And, and as I was talking about this with someone the other day, he, he actually said to me, hey, look, look back at what God has done. Because it ain't bad. It ain't bad. Like, take time and, and celebrate the goodness of God in the season of, of this church. And, and then to take that even a step further, to, to take time to celebrate as you look back over your own life and where God has brought you. I mean, some of you here today, you would not have pictured yourself here a year ago. Some of you here today, you, you are in some situation in which you looked back and you said, I had no idea how I made it through that other than God's hand was involved in it. And so there's this rhythm of celebration that we must take part in because it, it reminds us of the faithfulness of God and the strength that he'll continue to move us and direct us in the days ahead. So you have Ezra here, the, the people's pastor. And then Nehemiah, they come together and they say, hey, we, we need to celebrate. You know, we, we just did an amazing thing with the strength of God. We rebuilt the walls in 52 days. And, and so let's celebrate Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 3. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So it's one thing to preach the word for six hours. It's another thing to be attentive for six hours. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. There was a, a specific purpose. They, they built this stage to, in a way, kind of commemorate and, and, and make unique that celebration that, that Ezra built this wooden platform for this purpose, this stage for the celebration. And two things that I see here in, in this story as I'm even starting to flesh this out between the, the tension of celebration and correction, that there's, there's even a, a, a tension of, of sacrifice and celebration. That it's not sustainable to be all sacrifice and no celebration. Just as it's not sustainable to be all celebration and, and no sacrifice. If, if you're all celebration and no sacrifice, well, then, then that's the person, the, the young person, the 23-year-old who gets out of college who wants to have what their parents have, to live the lifestyle that their parents have without working for it, without being committed to it. It's the person who, who wants to get the, the participation trophy but have no training involved. It's the person who wants to take all of the, the blessing without any obedience. It's not sustainable to, to live a constant life of celebration. We, we almost become entitled when we live in that type of, of a sphere. And so Nehemiah is saying we've sacrificed so much. God has done amazing things over these last few months. It's time to celebrate. It's good to stop and to celebrate. It's good for us to stop and celebrate what God has done these last four years. There will be some pictures that scroll back here in, in the background. If you remember, this was when we started vision casting for the church. we have any OGs in here? Originals? Got a handful? Yeah, I see you in there. We're meeting in different houses. Oh, and then we had to buy a trailer. Because how are we going to get all the gear from here, there, and everywhere in between? And we started out the Sheridan Great Valley. That was a, a great space for about four months until they moved us around into that little tiny room. We were overflowing, splitting the seams. Then we moved to the, final, uh, the fire hall there at Lionville. And that was all but two. That was even worse than the, than the Sheridan Great Valley. But then we have amazing things that happen. We are meeting here at the school, doing good works for Cookie Project Drive here. There's our wonderful worship leader, Emily, leading us in courageous praise. People being baptized right here on the floor, bringing in a horse trough, putting warm water in it so it's somewhat comfortable for people to identify as followers of Jesus Christ. We've been so far here the last four years. 270 plus gatherings over 40 decisions for people to follow Jesus Christ, over 60 baptisms in four years. 
that in just a couple more weeks, like Reese said earlier, we're going to be heading back out to Marsh Creek Lake to celebrate those who are following Jesus into the waters of baptism. Let me just take a minute and, and describe that for a moment. We, we invite all of you to come in and celebrate on that day. 10 o'clock service, just one service. We are praying that the wa uh, weather is nice. And if it's not, we'll just move it in here. No problem, no big deal. Because the devil's not going to stop us from baptizing people who are committed to Jesus Christ and making that decision. We're going we're gonna to celebrate. We're going to have fun. We're going to have food and drinks. Bring your chairs and your tents and let's hang out lakeside for a couple of hours and celebrate all that God has done. That there are over 150 different volunteers here within the church that give up their time and energy to serve in some capacity. From people, yeah, that's a good thing to celebrate. People showing up here at 6.45 in the morning to set up chairs and speakers. People showing up at 8.30 to get ready to prep, to pour into our kids, the next generation, to help them meet, know, and follow Jesus. Women that, that offer studies for Tuesday evening. Women that work during the week, but then provide Friday morning opportunities for those who are home and, and even have kids provide babysitter that that there's all kinds of service happening here. People showing up and greeting you at the door. People that are working behind the scenes and just doing more administrative back end stuff because they don't want to be, you know, given any, like, they, they like just to be in the background and getting things done. Like there's so many good things that are happening. People that are serving not even within the church, but just in the community. Through the Bridge Academy and Community Center, through Chester County Women's Services, through the Lord's pantry there's so many good things that are happening and, and worth celebrating and for me it's hard to imagine it's been four years four years lots of sacrifice and so we're taking this day like Ezra we're, we're building a little bit of a platform a little bit of a, a stage if you will and we're gonna celebrate There'll be food in between services as you leave this place. There'll be things for the kids to jump around in and just enjoy one another and share what God has done. I encourage you to do that in between the services, to just share of God's goodness, to tell of his goodness. How has God moved in your life in the last year? What is he even doing now? And let's give him praise. Let's give him honor and glory. And when you think about it, this whole rhythm of celebration, God actually weaves into creation. A couple of weeks ago, we, we mentioned how even in creation, God weaves into this creation, the rhythm of rest. He also weaves into creation, the rhythm of celebration. And so after each day, God is, is speaking things into existence at the speed of sound, Things are happening, light is being formed, planets are being formed, the earth, water, creatures, plants, things are being formed. And at the end of each day, what does he take time to do? To say that it was good. He takes time to look back over what he had created and say, this is a, this is a good thing. This is a, a joyous thing. This is something worth celebrating. That Within creation is even this rhythm of celebration. And as even I got to think about that in our own lives, there, there are things that we celebrate instinctively. I don't know if, if you have children. We, we have three children, and it's, it's been fun to kind of see them develop over the last several years. We have a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old. But I, I go back to even the earliest times uh, when, when they were first born, and, you know, they're they're kind of worthless when they're first born. I mean, all they do is just eat, sleep, and mess their diapers. That's all they're good for. But then eventually they, they start crawling around. And how excited are we when they start crawling around? And then eventually they develop a little bit more and they pull themselves up on a table and take a step and we're, yes, I knew it. He's going to be a track star one day. We celebrate. We, we, we begin to celebrate the baby steps, don't we? But it's, in reality, it's like, it's still pitiful. You took one step and you fell down. Good job. You want a prize? 
But as parents, we, like, we celebrate that and we get excited and we get encouraged. And, but they, they can't survive on their own. They're not yet productive members of society. They took one step and we celebrate. Eventually that one step turns into two steps and three steps and we celebrate some more and, and then we place ourselves at the other end of the room and we say, come on, you got it, come on. And we're celebrating each step that that child takes as he or she develops and, and grows and then, and then the steps become running and jumping. And before you know it, they're in school and they're learning and their personalities are being developed and we, we celebrate the steps. And for some of you, those, those kids are now having kids of their own and you're celebrating the steps all along the way. I think what has happened in, in which we are, we, we've, we've cheapened what God has done in our lives in which he is every step of our faith journey. He's, he's like a father cheering on our steps. Come on, keep going, keep going. Keep going. You fell. Don't worry. Get back up. Keep going. This time you're going to get two steps. This time you're going to get three steps. And we've cheapened his grace because we're not recognizing the things that he's already done and celebrating those baby steps. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. So those baby steps of faith, we look back and we see how God has moved and that gives us the strength to take even bigger steps of faith in the future. That that small step of obedience eventually leads to a, a bigger step of obedience. That, that small step of surrender, giving God back that thing that you've been hanging on to that gives us the strength and the courage to let go of the bigger things that he continues to bless us with. That, that our Father in heaven is celebrating our steps. And if he is celebrating over us, if, if like the prophet Zephaniah says, that he is dancing over us and he is singing over us, maybe we should just take time to celebrate his goodness. And get into this rhythm of celebration each week coming together. Okay, God, this is how you moved this past week. And so I'm going to give you praise, I'm going to give you worship, I'm going to give you honor, I'm going to give you glory. Celebrating our steps allows us to recognize God's faithfulness in the past and rely on his strength for the future. Like there is actually strength to be gained when we take time to celebrate, to lift our spirits, to give us motivation and momentum for, for where God wants to lead us next. And, and it's not just in, in the church, it's, it's our own individual lives, what God is calling us to, the purposes and the plans that he has for us. I love what the prophet Zechariah says in Zechariah chapter four, he says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Has God done something small in your life? Celebrate it. Is God doing something small and seemingly insignificant? No, 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 no. In God's economy, there is no insignificance. In God's economy, you got it. Come on. You're almost there. Oh, did you see how you did that? That wasn't even you, that was me. Come on. Come on. Celebrate the steps. Celebrate the steps. Come on. Celebrate good times. Come on. Celebrate the steps. Some of us have lost momentum because we have stopped celebrating those small things. We've paralyzed ourselves. I lost two pounds, so I celebrated with a donut. Man, I remember where I was just six months ago. I was a lost, drowning, had no idea what to do with my life. 
But I, here I am today, overwhelmed by the grace of God, a new creation in Jesus Christ, a child of God. I just need to celebrate steps. Put that into the rhythm of our everyday lives. Can we do that? Let's stand together. Thank you.